you wanted to talk to me about something? Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, what just happened is John Brown come to my, came to my house in Rochester, New York to visit. John Brown stayed in my house for exactly a month. I charged John Brown for staying in my home. I charged him a mere three dollars, a three dollars a month. And in his time that he stayed in my home, I have you know that he became uh, my daughter Rosetta, my son Louis, Frederick Jr. They all took to him because he had war stories to tell. John Brown's mission was to go to Harp Harper's Valley with some slaves and to kill all the slave owners. That was his mission. And I respected John Brown very much so because of the fact that he had the gall to do what I dreamed of. He had the gall to do with many, what many black slaves wanted to do. And, it, and if you know anything about history, the only one black slave that was mad enough to do it was Nat Turner. Well, John Brown wanted me to go with him to Harper's Valley. I had a conversation with John Brown telling John Brown that I do not think that's a good idea. I think if you go to Harper's Valley, I think that will be your doom, John Brown. But John Brown insisted on wanting to go to Harper's Valley. We met out in the field, him and I. And as I looked up into the mountains, I saw that there were six young men with rifles. As, so as to protect John Brown in case the enemies would come. Well, John Brown and I, we stood face to face looking at each other. And I said, John Brown, please, please, sir, don't do this. His rebuttal was, Frederick, I must do this. For the sake of the slaves and the freedom, I must do this. And I begged him, but ultimately, we hugged each other. And as he turned around to walk away, he looked back at me and he said, whether I live or I die, slavery must end. Well, I have you know, a couple of weeks later, the news came back that John Brown was hung. John Brown was hung once he got to Harper's Valley. The rebel troops came in and destroyed John Brown and all of those young men that he took with him. Well, what happened to me? I wound up getting on a Capria, which is a ship, going to Canada, because they had a feeling that I had something to do with it, which I didn't. Well, I went to Canada at the time that the festival was taking place. I was 27 years old when I went to Canada. I stayed in Canada for two years. I came back from Canada when I was 29 years old. And I'll jump back to that a little later. Because when I came back from Canada at the age of 29 years old, something special happened. I'll tell you that in a minute. But let me go back to the beginning. Can I go back to the beginning? <laughs> okay. Back to the 70s. Right on, brother. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to get up and go, let's do it, brother. Right on. But anyway, let me get back to my mother. My, my, my. I just had a flashback with the big afros and whatnot. But anyway, they say I was born on February the 14th, 1818. I believe for the longest that I was born in 1817. Well, record shows that Frederick Douglass which was not my real name, was born February the 18th. February 1818, and I believe your Friday is the 14th. Is that right? Yes. So that marks 202 years since my birth. So please, nobody touch me because I don't want the dust to come out of me. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's name is Harriet Bailey. They say my mother was a very intelligent and smart young lady. 
the record shows that my mother educated herself somehow, meaning that she might have snuck to educate herself. Well, even though she was on another plantation 12 miles away, believe it, my mother would travel 12 miles come sometimes four times a week. Can you imagine traveling 12 miles through the woods with no shoes on in the pit of the night? Just imagine what your feet is stepping on and the, the aches and pains that you're going through. Well, we didn't have electricity. However, my mother would find my cabin. She would come in and she would pick me up and she would rock me. And as she would rock me, she would sing to me. The song that she would sing to me is My Little Valentine. And that's another indication, indicator that I was born on February the 14th. The question always comes up is, well, who is my father? They say my father is Captain Aaron Anthony. Captain Aaron Anthony is a slave owner. That means that somehow he had a relation with my mother. I disowned him as my father. However, they say he was my father. And to be honest with you, even though he was my father, you would think that I got some type of leadway. No. He would whip me like he would whip the rest of the slaves. Talking about the slaves, just imagine. Each one of you all have a nice home. Each one of you all sleep in a nice bed. Well, for us, we didn't have that luxury. Our luxury was sleeping on the floor. During those cold months, and please understand, in Baltimore, it get cold. So during those cold months, we would huddle up together. Sometimes I would find myself in a wool sack, a potato sack, to keep myself warm from all the cold that would be going on outside. So furthermore, can you imagine, as I stand here and I look at the little babies here, can you imagine all the way up to the age of seven years old not being able to take a bath? Can you imagine no shoes? Can you imagine having one garment to wear the whole year. And if that garment is destroyed or you outgrow that garment, well, here's the wind. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Can you imagine? No food, I mean, no, no eating utensils. Where your eating utensils wind up being maybe a, a, a stick or maybe your hands when you scoop it up to slurp it up. That would be your eating. Or maybe even when you, you attempt to take a bath, your bath water is the pond. What goes on in the pond? The pond is where the mothers wash clothes. The pond, that's where the animals, the pigs, the horses, and you name it, go to take care of themselves. But we also had to use that water as well. I recall one night, huddled up with the family, and I heard this screeching sound. It scared me half to death. So I got up to go and figure out to see what this sound was. As I got there, and I looked around the corner because I didn't want to be seen, I looked. It was no other than my master. My master with a whip. And my Aunt Hester strung up with a back showing. And I could hear him with that whip, tagging her with it. And as, she tag, as he tagged my aunt with it, I could see the blood splattering out of her back as she screamed and hollered. Why was he whipping my aunt? Because my aunt had a relation with a young man by the name of Ned. Ned also was a slave, but Ned was on another plantation. They would get together in courtship. Massa was, was me mad at that because of the fact that Massa light my aunt. And I recall him saying, don't you never go back over there and see that, that man Ned. If I ever see you with Ned again, I'm going to whip you until I can't whip you no more. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, master. Yes, master. And I got so scared that I ran back and I jumped in between the other family members and I cried the whole night. Because I was scared listening to and seeing what I saw as a young child. 
to move on. My master Andrews, he had a daughter. His daughter, Miss Lucretia. Miss Lucretia did not know that she had a little brother. She was unaware that I was her brother. So, I guess, I guess, what do they call it? ESP, I guess, you know, where you could just feel something. So it was something in the air that I guess she felt because she was very kind to me. She would just about make sure that I was fed, make sure that I was taken care of. Now, she couldn't stop the whippings, but she took care of me in a way. And you know, young lady, I even got a piece of pie. Yeah, that pie was delicious. That's right. Well, one day, Miss Lucretia called me. She said, Fred, Fred, come, Fred, come. So I said, yes, ma'am. Now, please understand, if you're a slave, you're not allowed to look the white people in their eyes. So when I got up to Miss Lucretia, quite naturally, I got up to her because I could see her feet. And as I see her feet, she said, Fred, I want you to go to the big house. I said, the big house? Yes, I want you to go to the big house, and I want you to go up on the second floor, and I want you to get into that bathtub. Bathtub? What's a bathtub? You're going to take a bath. At seven years old, I was allowed to take my first bath. I have you know, when I got in that bathtub and I splish and I splashed that water, I must have been in that, that water for maybe about two and a half hours because that water felt so good. And out of nowhere, I heard Miss Lucretia screaming, Frederick, Frederick, what are you doing up there? You've been in that water for two and a half hours. Get out of that water. I was taking a bath, ma'am. Well, you need to get out that water because you have been in that water too long. Sir, I really didn't want to get out that water because that water was nice. That was my first bath. And on top of that, when I got out the bathtub, guess what she had waiting for me? Not a whip. How about a pair of pants? Not a whip. How about a nice little shirt? Not a whip. How about a nice pair of shoes? Now, please understand, I've never wore a pair of shoes before. As a matter of fact, because of the fact that I've never wore a pair of shoes, the bottom of my foot was so cracked that you could actually take a pin and put it in the inserts of my foot. Now you can imagine, only if you can, me put my foot for the first time in those shoes. I'll have you know, those shoes hurt. I was walking like this. That's how much they were hurting. But you know, I enjoyed the pain because I had me a brand new pair of shoes on, so it didn't matter. Well, she said to me, Miss Lucretia, she said, Frederick, you're going to Baltimore. I was seven years old when they put me on a carriage that sent me to Baltimore. When I got to Baltimore, believe it or not, as we rolled up to the house on Philpot Street, I looked in my little childish way, and I saw three people standing at the doorway of the home. The three people that were standing at the doorway of the home was no other than Miss Sophia Ard, her husband, Hugh Ard, and her little child, Tommy. And as I began to walk up to the house, I said earlier that we are not allowed to look white folks in the face. So when I started walking up to the home, Miss Lucretia was standing there, and I stood right there, I could see her feet, and she said, Frederick, welcome, Frederick, welcome, we love you. And I'm like, okay. And she said, look at me. Now I'm saying to myself, this lady must want to get me beaten, because I'm not going to look at her. Well, she said, Frederick, you can look at me. Well, what she wound up doing was taking her finger, her hand, and putting it up under my chin, and as she lifted my face up, I came up as such. And she said, Frederick, open your eyes. And I'm thinking to myself, this lady really want to get me killed. I am not opening my eyes. So she said, Frederick, you better open your eyes. So when I opened up my eyes and I saw what I saw, I saw the big blue eyes, I saw the rosy cheeks, and I saw teeth that seemed to go forever and ever and ever. Well, from there, Mr. Hugh Hard came before me. And he said, Frederick, 
You're here to take care of Tommy. You are Tommy's toy. And I said, yes, Massam, yes, Massam. And then little Tommy came, because little Tommy was maybe about six or seven years old, my age. So he knew no better. He came and he put his hand out and he shook my hand. Yeah, as to welcome me. Well, I have you know, after that was all over, Miss Sophia, she didn't treat me as a slave. Miss Sophia, she, she actually treated me like I was one of the family. As a matter of fact, what do I mean? Well, Miss Sophia gave me a bed to sleep in. During mealtime, I got the opportunity to sit at the dinner table. I could eat anything I wanted to eat. I could go out and play. Yeah! I was like a son. Well, Miss Sophia, she had little issues in reading. Yes, she did. So she would, sometimes she'd be in the living room. She'll have a magazine. Sometimes she'll have the Bible. Sometimes she'll have a book. And she'll be there attempting to read. And she would call Frederick, me, and she would call Tommy. Frederick! Here I come. I come running in. I'm going attempting to sit on the floor. She said, no, Frederick. Have a seat on the couch. So I sat on the couch. And we start doing our little ABCs and what have you. And one day while we were doing our ABCs, we heard a little thump. As we looked, it was Master Odd coming in the doorway. When Master Odd came in and he saw what was taking place, he said, Sophia, I dare you to be in here teaching them little Negro boys how to read. You teach them how to read, then they're going to want to take over. Don't you let me see you doing that again. Well, she looked up at Master Odd and said, but honey, I didn't know. His response was, now you know. Don't do it again. Well, I have you know, Master came over and he stood before me. And as he came over and stood before me, my head dropped in a split of a second. And he stood right here. And he said, Frederick, you're not here to read. Don't you never let me catch you reading again. My response, Master, I'm never going to read. I hate reading. Reading bad, Master. I'll never read again in my life. Well, I'll have all you grown folks and all you little ones in here know. That's what came out my mouth. But in my mind, I was attempting to get my hand on any and everything that I could read. Because of the fact that he started something. He opened up Pandora's box in my mind. Well, little Tommy would go to school. And little Tommy would come home from school. Well, what does little Tommy have in his hand? He got books. Tommy would take those books upstairs. And when the family would go out on an outing and they would leave me home by myself, I would run upstairs. And as I run upstairs, I'll start opening those books. Tommy even had what is it called a little cursor machine, the writing cursor. I would go upstairs and I would start practicing how to write my name in cursor. That's right. Well, one day they came home and they said, Frederick, Frederick, where are you, Frederick? I said, I was up here. You better not be up there reading. Master, I hate reading. I never read. I was up here cleaning. Sir, I wasn't cleaning. I was reading. <laughs> well, as time went on, Master had got comfortable with me. Master got so comfortable with me, he started sending me out to the store. Yeah, he would send me on errands. And ladies and gentlemen, would you believe they would pay me to go to the store? So I asked you all a question. How much you think they would pay me, little Freddie, to go to the store? Take a guess. A dollar? A dollar? That's, this is 2020. A penny. That's right. They would pay me a penny to go to the store. And I have you know, I would save those pennies. Also, they would also send me to the store, and I would go to the kitchen, and I would get bread, and I would chop that bread up, and I would put it in my pocket, and then I would skip on down to the store. Well, guess who was down to the store? Poor white boys who were hungry. They were hungry. I was hungry. They were hungry for food. I was hungry for knowledge. So when I came up and approached these poor boys, I would ask them to teach me how to read. Sir? I'll give you a piece of bread, you teach me how to read. As a matter of fact, 
They were out there spelling the word hat. I didn't know how to spell a hat. Anybody here know how to spell a hat? I didn't know how to spell it. Well, as a matter of fact, I had them to spell hat. You want a piece of bread? Spell hat. Well, they spelled it one time, H-A-T. And I said, that ain't how you spell hat. You, you, you joshing me. They said, Fred, that is how we spell hat. I said, no, it ain't. If that's how you spell hat, then spell it again. H-A-T. I'm telling you, that is not how to spell hat. Spell it again. And the reason I had them to spell it three times, because that way it could get to my long-term memory, and I could not forget so when they spell it three times, now I got it. H-A-T. Hat. Here's your bread. And to believe it or not, I am the one who started what is called the barter system. I'll be starting signing autographs when you all leave, all right, because you're meeting the gentleman that started the barter system. Well, those pennies that I was getting for going to the store, I did not spend those pennies on candy. I did not spend those pennies on nice jewelry. I did not spend those pennies on tattoos. I did not spend those pennies, sir, on Jordans. I spent those pennies on the most important thing that meant the most to me, a book. And that book was no other than the Columbian Order. That book had and it contained speeches from great individuals such as President George Washington, President uh, Thomas Jefferson, Eager Allen Poe, and a few other great ones. And I learned every poem, speech in that book. So much so that I almost forgot, sir, that I was a slave. Meaning that I got in trouble. Because I heard Master Ard telling Miss Sophia, sir, you know, uh, Frederick don't sound like a slave. He sounded mighty intelligent. And by this time, I was maybe about 14, 15 years old, about tall as I am now, and I had some little muscles on me and what have you. Well, they decided that they were going to ship me off. And they shipped me off. You know where they shipped me off? They shipped me off to the slave breaker. That's right. They shipped me off to the snake. That's right. They shipped me off to Master Corvée. That's right. Master Corvée was known as the snake and the slave breaker. Why was he known as the slave breaker and the snake? Well, number one, Master Corvée was a poor master. Master Corvée had one slave. Master Corvée would get other slaves and he would courtship, courtship them in order to get more slaves. And when those slaves grew, he had some more slaves or he could sell them. Well, I got it my first day on this plantation, if you will, it wasn't, hi, Freddie, how are you? Come on in. No, as soon as I stepped on that plantation, I have you know, Massa whipped me. When I walked on that plantation, I was walking as such. Yes, Massa. By days in, or maybe the weekend, or maybe even the month in, I was walking like this. Because Massa had broke me. Every day he would whip me with that whip. Every day I would feel those 50 lashes on my back. Yes, Master would whip me because his mission was to break me. And I can recall just standing here, I can recall one day just standing by the Chesapeake on the bank of the Chesapeake. And I saw the water as it roamed so free. It would go north and sometimes it would shift and it would go south. Sometimes the water would get a little wavy and go out to the west or wavy and get to the east. And I would stand there and I would watch this water. And I would even begin to talk to this water. And I'd say, one day I hope to be free like you. But then again, I'll probably spend my whole life as a slave. I'll never experience freedom. And I also recall one day there was a couple of slave owners that came by on horses. And one of the slave owners looked at me. And well, they looked at each other. And then they questioned me. They said, are you a slave? I said, yes, sir. And then I heard them talking to each other. He's a nice looking slave. And then they came back to me and they said, you should go north. You should run away. Well, I knew that it was a ploy because if I run away, who's to say that they would be on the other end with somebody waiting on me to run away? And when, I, when they would catch me, that meant that they got paid. So I had to use my little intelligence and just stay there as a slave and continue to get these weapons until that one miraculous day.
that one miraculous day when I was out with the other slaves and gathering up the hay, and we had to pass it on to the next slave, and that slave would put it in the machine. Well, this particular day, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden I started getting pain in my side. And Isaiah said, Frederick, you know Master Corvée is a, a snake. You best to get 